Often called the world's first assault rifle, the Sturmgewehr 44 is an essential addition to many Second World War movies, TV shows or video games. The rifle has been a huge influence on firearms history as well as a recurring role in the World War II games like Medal of Honor and Call of Duty that dominated the early 2000s. And while often one of the most powerful entries into the arsenal of these video games, does the truth of this historical weapon match up to its iconic on-screen legacy? And does its appearance in games today still kick up a storm? Despite the Sturmgewehr 44's fame and reputation today, it is widely reported that much of its design and prototyping stages were hidden from the eyes of the leader of the Third Reich through subterfuge and deception. It was designed by German weapon designer Hugo Schmeiser, who during the First World War also designed what can today be considered the world's first submachine gun, the MP18. During Operation Barbarossa, Nazi Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, German infantry and commanders found that the Red Army were using increasing numbers of semi-automatic SVT-38 and SVT-40 rifles, as well as PPSH-41 submachine guns, resulting in high volumes of incoming fire that they found difficult to return with the bolt-action KAR-98K as well as their other small arms. They needed a middle ground between the 7.92 by 57 mm rifle cartridge used by the KAR-98 and Gewehr-41, and the 9 by 19 parabellum of the MP40. This led to the standard rifle round being cut down into the 7.92 by 33mm Kurtz or short in an effort to fit this intermediate need as well as minimizing logistical issues. Two firearms manufacturers were issued the round and asked to submit prototypes under the name Machine and Carabiner 1942 or MKB42, with one of the groups headed by Schmeiser. But when Hitler became aware of the trials and development, he ordered that all work on the rifles stopped and demanded that newer submachine guns were to be built instead. However, to keep the program alive, the weapon was designated as the Machine and Pistol 43 or MP43 and the weapon project was disguised as an upgrade to existing submachine guns. Hitler eventually learned of the deception and halted the program again, but would allow it to resume between March and September of 1943 for the purposes of evaluation. The results would allow the project to continue with the goal of mass production, with further improvements being made resulting in the weapon being redesignated as the MP44. The origins of the infamous Storm-themed name are debated, whether it came from Hitler himself or the Axis propaganda machine. But in July 1944, at a meeting about the Eastern Front, when he asked the various army heads present what they needed, one answered, more of these new rifles, which caused some confusion when Hitler replied, what new rifles? There are reports that when the STG-44 was fielded, it fulfilled its role effectively. Due to its availability and some tactical reluctance still surrounding the weapon, it was not widely issued, often given to each soldier within assault platoon, as well as a number being fit with ZF-4 telescopic sights for individual marksmen within a unit. Some were also equipped with an infrared night scope named the Zieglerat 1229, or Vampire sight, which was powered by a battery and transformer worn as a 15 kilogram backpack. Even more unusual was the Krumlauf, a curved barrel with a periscope attached designed to shoot round corners or from the hatches of tanks from relative safety. By war's end, Hugo Schmeiser claimed that 424,000 rifles had been produced. This was much fewer than the 1.5 million that were ordered and much, much fewer than the 4 million planned. And there are reports that state only half of those produced even made it to the front. And despite arguments that the Kingdom of Italy's Che Rigotti of 1890 or the Russian Empire's Fedorov Avtomat of 1913 deserve to be called history's first assault rifle, the cases for both of those weapons are much weaker than those in support of the STG-44. As with most things in firearms history, or I suppose any, any history, it really does depend on the criteria you apply as to what the first of anything is. I think what we can probably, hopefully, all agree on is that the name Okay, not the literal translation, but the, the reasonable translation is assault rifle. Sturmgewehr, storm rifle, they don't mean storm with rain coming out of the sky. They mean assaulting a position, storming a position. So in concept and, oh, oh well, okay, in name, it is definitely the first assault rifle. The term, the term assault rifle itself is not always that helpful. Where it's the most useful is the role defined by the Sturmgewehr in, that, in the Second World War 
of a, a mass issue rifle that replaces bolt action and semi-automatic more powerful rifles and it's this idea that you can switch to automatic and assault a trench or a pillbox. So for me, for a, for a certain value of X, <laughs> or whatever the mathematical expression is, yes, the Stonegevere is the first assault rifle. I'm happy to go on record with caveats as saying that. So with all of its fame and history, and the grand title of world's first assault rifle, how is the STG-44 portrayed in our pop culture and in our video games? I'm betting that the reason many of you know what the STG-44 is and why you clicked on this video is because of a memory you have of using it in one of the many games it has appeared in across the years. But that's not really the case in cinema, because compared to many other weapons or concepts we've covered on this show before, the STG appears in relatively few movies, especially when compared to its life in games, even if it did get a little cameo in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. The weapon is much rarer than the KR-98 or an MP40, so potentially more difficult or expensive to feature as an authentic prop on screen, or because of considerations to historical accuracy with the thought given to how many rifles were on the front line, as well as the setting of the film. For the most part, these are simply factors that many video games haven't wanted to or needed to consider, least of all the availability of real-world weapons, making the SDG-44 all the more appealing to recreate digitally. One of the earliest flashes we get of an STG-44 in a game is in 1994 in the mission packs of Wolfenstein 3D, Spear of Destiny. The pixelated sprites, iconic to the grandfather of the FPS genre, were changed from an MP40-inspired look to something more like the STG-44, yet the generic title of simply Machine Gun remained. Flash forward five years and Medal of Honor for the PlayStation 1 releases to near universal acclaim, beginning the trend of World War II first-person shooters. One year later, riding the success of their previous game, DreamWorks and EA would launch Medal of Honor Underground, becoming one of the first major mainstream games to feature the Sturmgewehr 44. Sure, by today's standards, the rifle has certainly looked better, but despite the blocky turn of the millennium graphics, it undoubtedly retains the features and details of the STG-44. From here, whenever Medal of Honor explored the European theater of World War II, the STG-44 followed. From Allied Assault, Frontline and Airborne, it was cemented as an essential entry in the game's arsenal, a story that would echo into other franchises as well. <laughs> Series like Brother in Arms, Red Orchestra, Day of Defeat, Company of Heroes and beyond featured the STG-44 in one variant or another. And of course in 2003 we would see the new dawn of what would grow into the biggest shooter franchise in the world. Call of Duty's first entry released on October 29th, 2003 to critical acclaim. There was more emphasis on the authenticity of the virtual World War II battlefield than other shooters at the time, and it was one of the first games to implement iron sights as a gameplay mechanic. And so the Sturmgewehr found another franchise to call its home. The STG-44 features in every World War II Call of Duty title except for Finest Hour all the way from the first of the franchise up until 2021's Vanguard, and even throughout the Nazi zombie entries. The culmination of this is that the STG-44 is the second most featured weapon in the franchise, tied with the MP40 and second only to the M1911. Although the series pivoted into modern day with Call of Duty 4, it seems like Infinity Ward couldn't let go of one of the franchise's most beloved weapons. The MP44 is the last assault rifle to be unlocked in the game, but its appearance in COD 4 was a bit of a double-edged sword. Its performance was lacking compared to most other weapons, and it was missing any of the customization options that Call of Duty 4 was well known for, but that made it all the more impressive when you topped the scoreboard with it. Throughout the weapon's life in games, there has been a push and a pull between its reputation as a fairly uncommon small arms wonder weapon and the rifle's growing recognition with gamers. But I suppose as ever it comes down to context. If we're playing our game in the, in the Second World War era, which is typically where this thing crops up, then it prob there probably shouldn't be as many of them as, even as there are necessarily. You know, 200,000 guns doesn't go very far in an army of you know, millions. And without the ability to model poor quality control issues, um, I mean, how accurate these things were is, is a bit of an open question. It wasn't the ideal time or place to be developing the next revolution in small arms technology. If you want to talk about how things might have been different, uh, Germany would have probably been better off not even trying and just issuing what they had and using the automatic weapons they had. After all, Britain, along with others, 
managed to win the war with bolt action rifle. So games will glorify the technology and, and so, so will experts like me, I suppose. Uh, we'll tend to focus on how cool the technology is and how advanced that is, but you have to look at the context. The point Jonathan makes throws up some interesting disparities between the STG-44's place in history and its portrayal in pop culture. In many single player campaigns and stories, the STG-44 was often one of the best weapons available to the player, although a rare one to see, usually confined to some of the later missions towards the end of the story or utilised by elite soldiers. In multiplayer games, it was frequently unlocked late in a player's progression, used as an upgrade to experienced troops, or there were restrictions applied to the classes that could utilise the rifle. It can be argued that many of these elements are playing to the ideas surrounding the weapon's real-world rarity, as well as the advantages and effectiveness of the rifle. To players, the SDG-44 was a popular and desirable sight. The power the games were giving it made for exciting moments, and its automatic fire added exciting variety, and so the virtual weapon's popularity and recognition grew. But as shooters developed, so did the tastes and expectations of players. Many more games began to explore modern day settings, no doubt encouraged by the success of COD 4. And with more modern firearms, automatic fire was much more common in games, especially when compared to the World War II arsenals many players had become accustomed with. There were more options of different guns to put into the hands of players, with the bulk of many virtual arsenals giving the players the ability to go full auto. As it turns out, once you go full auto, it can be pretty hard to go back. When games as a whole started to explore World War II again, they were putting the STG-44 into the hands of players earlier and earlier, making it a more common sight across multiplayer and campaigns, a fact that somewhat went against the rifle's place in reality. Today, many of the biggest shooter franchises feature the Sturmgewehr 44 as one of the earliest unlocks, with games well aware of the familiarity players have built around the weapon since it first started to appear in our video games. Developers are also aware of the broad player desire for fully automatic weaponry as well as firearm variety, with many games using historic backdrops as their setting, supplementing their selection of firearms by giving a full auto option to weapons that never had it, or giving a virtual life to obscure prototypes or guns that were a much rarer sight in history than the STG-44. In a bizarre twist, the Sturmgewehr 44's life in games has grown to the point where even the appearance of this fairly uncommon end-of-war weapon actually makes more sense than a lot of other firearms that it shares a virtual arsenal with. It's been able to stand the test of time as gaming trends explore different universes and styles, whether it's twisted into alternate sci-fi history in the Wolfenstein games, or newer tactical, historically authentic shooters like Hell That Loose, which leans a little more into the real-world operation, history and availability of the STG-44. But in whatever form, variant or implementation it exists, it has undoubtedly become one of the most iconic weapons of the Second World War, especially when we look into that period of time through the lens of pop culture. The STG-44 certainly deserves a little of the virtual spotlight given to weapons like the Thompson, M1 Garand, Sten or PPSH, especially when you take into account not only its pop culture presence, but the enormous influence and inspiration that the world's first assault rifle has had on firearms history and development. So the, the technological legacy, um, and the tactical legacy actually, of the, of the Sturmgewehr is pretty massive. But of course the biggest legacy is the, um, the Soviets essentially copying uh, not so much the rifle, but the ammunition, you know, absolutely saw the value in the concept of a reduced power rifle cartridge, intermediate between pistol and rifle, and ran with it and designed two, well more than two, uh, multiple weapons to chamber that round. In terms of the significance of the type, it's, it's more so the ammunition, but we certainly can't overlook the inspiration that it gave to the various Soviet developers working on their first assault rifle, which gave us the Kalashnikov of course, and everyone else who's ever developed a light, relatively light automatic rifle or assault rifle. Even the AR-15 owes a debt to the Sturmgewehr, specifically the dust cover. If you look at the folding dust cover on an AR-15, M16, any of, any of the family, it's taken directly from the Sturmgewehr with the sprung flap that latches shut and then pops open if you either cock it or if you fire it. Brilliant design, keeps the, the mechanism nicely sealed against dirt and dust and mud and all of that. Whereas the AR-15 is light years ahead of the Sturmgewehr in just about every way, there's that, still that one bit from 
the great granddaddy of them all, uh, the STG. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Loadout. If you did, as always, hit the like button, subscribe for more like this, and let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, or you can reach out to me directly at Irregular Dave. If you want to see more video game firearms content, you can watch the previous series of the show, or check out our weekly series of Expert Reacts, where I show our friends at the Royal Armouries a slew of guns to break down. I, I feel like I need to, to hold this and tell it that everything's going to be okay. Until next time, I've been your host, Dave Jewett. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you in the next one.